That's good. All right. There is a suppressing satanic spirit in this house this morning. Many of you Christians know that. You sense it. All right, pray with me. My Lord Jesus Christ, I plead the blood on this service right now. My Lord Jesus Christ, I come against this enemy, and I come against them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, you've already won the victory. You won it at Calvary. And Lord, we don't stand this morning in our own power. We're nothing, Father. We're nothing without Thee. And I pray, Father, for freedom this morning. I pray for the movement of the Holy Ghost, and I pray that you'd bless in this service. There may be some specific reason why Satan wants to stop this. I don't know. I don't need to know, but I do, I do know this, Lord. I know that in the name of Jesus, he must move back. He must, he must. And I plead the blood against you, Satan. In the name of Jesus, I come against you. And I plead the victory at the cross at Calvary against you. You have no power. You don't own me. You no longer, I am no longer yours. 1973, that bond was broken. In the name of the Lord Jesus, now, Father, bless in the service. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to Luke chapter 7 with me this morning, please. And verse number 36. Luke chapter 7 and verse number 36. I'd like to stand as we open the pages of the infallible Word of God. If it's not infallible, don't bother with it, folks. Get you a Sears and Roebuck catalog. Well, better still, they're about to close. You might want to get something else. Luke chapter number 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. He went to the Pharisee's house, sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him five hundred pence, the other fifty. When they had nothing to pay, frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said to him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? Now notice how this happens. He turned to the woman, but spoke to the man. Seest thou how this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water to my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, notice how he speaks to her now. He's been looking at her all this time while he's speaking to Simon. He's been looking at the woman. Try to get yourself in that situation. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth a little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this? that forgiveth sins also. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Father, anoint the word as it goes forth from the mouth of this messenger and glorify thyself, Lord. Receive glory from me and this ministry. I want none. Let it all go to thee. In the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake I pray, amen. You can be seated. Luke chapter number 7 is one, of my, is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. This woman right here, is, every time I read about her, it just moves my soul. It stirs me. It's like when Mary went to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning and no one was there. And she saw him but did not recognize him immediately. And then when she finally did, she said, Rabboni. And she fell at his feet. And my friend, in the book of Luke chapter number 7, here's a woman the Pharisee, the guest, and our Lord Jesus Christ. These, these are the four that come into this room together. The Pharisee, the guest, 
the woman, and our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Luke begins telling us very quickly and clearly what went on inside the room that day. You can't help but read this when you do. It begins to move your heart because regardless of what you think about this woman, she was moved. When she came into this room, tears were flowing from her face. And her hair obviously was long. The scripture teaches that a woman's hair is her glory and for her to cover her head. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 that a woman's hair is for a covering because of the angels. Now that has a lot of implications in it. But it simply means that a woman had hair because of her long hair was an indication, first of all, she was a woman and that it was her glory. It was hers to glorify for them to know this is a woman made in the image of God from the man and we can differentiate her from the man very easily and very clearly from a distance. So we have here in Luke chapter number 7 a woman that is a sinner, verse 37. She was a notorious sinner. No doubt she was a sinner in the sense that she had a reputation in the whole town and the whole countryside. And so nobody wanted to be around this woman. Now we don't know exactly what her sin was. We have no idea. There are those who say that this woman was Mary Magdalene. Then there are those that defend her to the hilt and say this is not Mary Magdalene. We don't know one way or the other. We do know this about Mary Magdalene. The Bible said at one time, the Bible says God cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. She was a demon-possessed woman. And from that day on, for the rest of her life, she was dedicated to one person, and that was our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have a woman that is completely dedicated to Christ, and she's not afraid to let people know her condition and what she thinks about him, for she came into this room. And the Bible says here that in verse number 37, being a notorious sinner, the man sitting there was a Pharisee, and his life was all about what people perceived in him. He stood on the street corner and he prayed long prayers. He was a very professional religious person. People had great respect in him and all of that, and he was part of the nature, the fabric, the woof, and the wharf of Israel. The Pharisee had their beginning during the Babylonian captivity. It was there that they rose up against the idolatry that got Israel there to begin with. And it was there that the Pharisee from that day on established himself as a true believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The start was right. The place was right. The reason for it was right. But as everything that is man-made, it devolved into a situation of self-righteousness. The Pharisee was more consumed with himself and his own righteousness than he was with the one and the only one that can give righteousness. So the Pharisee had invited him into his home. Now, I don't know why I invited him. Maybe he wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to come in so he could ask him some questions. So he could find out a few things about this man that all these groups were following. Maybe he had a reason. Maybe he had some personal reason that he wanted to have him to his house. Who knows? But I do know this. I know that what transpired before the eyes of this Pharisee was the last thing in the world that he expected to see. Amen. There's something about the Lord Jesus Christ that draws people unto him. He said, if I be lifted up from this earth, I will draw all men unto me. Nothing has changed. That was a direct reference to the crucifixion 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus was nailed to the cross. But it is also a, a direct reference to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians when he said, I came to know nothing among you. Yes but Christ and Him crucified. I believe we would be far better off today if it was less about men and more about Christ. If it was less about our churches and more about Christ. If it was less about our ministries and more about Christ. I believe the church would be far better off today if when men and women walk into the house, into the wall, into the building where, where, which called itself a church, if all they heard about was the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we'd be far, far, far better off. And so here in the book of Luke chapter number seven, the apostle Luke wants to lay the groundwork for us to understand what real forgiveness and real worship and real repentance and real faith is all about. For everything you see in Luke chapter number seven, my dear friend, is real to the bone. There's nothing put on here. There's no hypocrisy. There's no acting. None of that. Everything you see is as real as it can get. Notice the woman, first of all, the Bible said in verse 37, a woman Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus said it meet in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box 
of ointment. Now let me say something about sinners in Christ. Would you hear me? The Bible said one day they brought a woman to Christ that was taken in adultery. Now they brought her there to be condemned. They brought her there to be stoned to death. They brought her there to be done away with. But oh, what a mistake they made. I want you to understand the last person on this earth that you want to take to Christ is somebody you want to do away with. If you, my friend, bring them to Christ, He's going to help them. Amen. And when, he, when they brought her to Christ, she left that place a completely changed and different woman. And so did every last one of them that drug her into His presence. So there's something about the Lord Jesus Christ that appeals to sinners. There's something about Him that reaches way down inside the heart and soul of every one of us and draws us to the Son of God. Amen. Yes, it does. Amen. There's something about the Lord Jesus Christ and sin and sinners that becomes the remedy for all of our problems. It's not what He does for us. It's not what people say about Him. It's not all the things that you might hear about the Lord Jesus Christ that matters. Then what does, preacher? Him. Amen. To have the Son is to have eternal life. And not have the Son is not to have eternal life. I'm afraid we spend an awful lot of time talking about Him. I'm afraid we spend an awful lot of time, uh, you know, singing songs and writing stories and this and that about Him. But we don't spend any time with Him. He that hath the Son hath life. Your life should be about Christ. It should be from the time you get up in the morning till you go to bed at night. It should be about Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, for there is none other like Him. Notice the Bible said in verse number 38, And she stood at His feet behind Him weeping. Somebody said, oh, her heart was broken. She must have been crying. She must have been heartbroken about something. Oh, no, 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 no. One of the great truths of spiritual discernment is to learn the difference between a tear of joy and a tear of sorrow. These are not tears of sorrow. She's not in a funeral dirge. Here's a woman that was weeping with joy. Joy was flowing forth from her soul. Say, how do you know that, preacher? Because of what she did next. In verse number 38, she stood at his feet behind him weeping. The tears were flowing like a river. And she began to wash his feet with these tears. Had she do that? Well, she probably gathered them in her hands. As they fell from her eyes, as uncontrollably she wept, as the joy flooded from her soul, my like a river. The Bible said there is peace like a river. And the joy that comes up from deep down inside. Ever had that? The Bible says that we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Ever had that? Have you ever really had the joy of the Lord? If you ever have had, you'll hunger for it again. Because you can't have it every day. You can't live on a mountaintop. But that joy is your strength. And there is no substitute for the joy of the Lord. Oh yeah, you can go to a religious service. You can get all pumped up. You can get all worked up with the music. But you'll be let down as fast as you got pumped up. But you let the joy of the Lord begin to take hold of your soul. And those tears will flow. You ever had that happen? You ever been, in the, ever you been alone by yourself? Not another soul around you. Nobody to impress. Nobody. Just you and God. And the tears come forth from your soul. Hallelujah to God for the joy of the Lord. Amen. Thank God for freedom too. That spirit has absolutely lifted. Hallelujah. Thank God for those of you that prayed. For when I got up here this morning, I felt like hands were choking my throat. And I couldn't speak. And God has removed that enemy. Hallelujah. So the Bible said here in Luke chapter number 7, they, he stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. She said, here, let me take my glory. She carried those hairs. Let me take this glory. And this is about what I'm about. I don't want any glory, she said. It's, it's not about me. I want you to see the one I'm about to worship. This is a worship service. Notice, it doesn't get any more personal. It doesn't get any more real. There is no more power to be found anywhere than a worship service like this when she poured her soul out and then she took her soul and she washed the feet of the Son of God with her hair. She washed it with her hair and once she had cleansed these feet, the dust of the earth away from his feet with the tears that flowed from her soul, washed them with her hair, she gently reached down 
took hold of these feet, these feet that carried him to the cross, these feet that walked on the Sea of Galilee, these feet that healed the sick, cast out devils. She took hold of these feet and she kissed them. <coughs> Compare this woman that is kissing the feet of the Son of God with Judas Iscariot that kissed him when he betrayed him. There's something about a kiss that tells you what you're made out of. The Bible says in the Old Testament there were those that kissed the image of Baal. I want you to know something. If he walked in this house this morning, it would do something. When Christ shows up, his very presence makes all the difference in the world. Just the presence of the Lord. Let me give you just a few of the things. The presence of the Lord creates controversy. Mark, Matthew chapter number 10 verse 35. He said, I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You can't be neutral with him. You can't say it doesn't matter. When the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is brought up, everybody's got an opinion about him. They ought to have. For he's the most important person that's ever walked the face of this earth. When you bring up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no other name like that name. That name makes people mad and that man name makes people glad. Some people, people piss us, curse and spit at the name of Jesus and some glorify God with tears rolling forth from their face. So the Lord Jesus Christ does create controversy and division. And the truth of the matter is unity for the sake of unity is nothing good. Just because everybody gets together, there's nothing great about that. May choose you this day, Joshua said, whom you will serve. That was the vision there. The Lord will divide. He'll set on one hand the sheep nations and the other hand the goat nations. Unity is the preaching of the one world government. Unity is what they want with all mankind. They want everybody to get together so they can control everybody. Let me tell you something, folks. There is one name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's the name that I will stand with for the rest of my days. Not only that, but according to Mark chapter number 1, verse number 24, the presence of Christ will do this. Sing, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The presence of Christ will bring terror into the heart of the wrong one. If you're sitting in this house today and you've got demons crawling all over you, you're not too happy. I don't care how much you put a plastic smile on. It's not going to make any difference whatsoever. You're dying inside and you can't wait till we shut up so you can get out that back door. Amen. 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 But hopefully you brought a demon in here with you and it'll leave and you'll stay. And you can get saved by the grace of God. Amen. You say, aren't you afraid of demons? I fear God. I want you to understand something, just like I did right here this morning. That wasn't planned. That wasn't planned. I've been at this a long time, and I know an evil spirit when it shows up. And I didn't plan anything, but I fear God. I don't fear demons. I fear God. Amen. I fear God. I fear the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I know that if the cross at Calvary, the blood of Christ is more powerful than any demon. Amen. He must answer to that authority. There is no more power on the face of this earth than a true believer in Christ approaching and confronting Satan or a demon. In the name of Jesus, it's got to go. Amen. Amen. I fear God, folks. I fear him. I fear him. So the Bible says that the presence of Christ will bring terror. According to Mark chapter number 1, these demons were very, very, very upset. And they said, have you come to torment us before our time? He said, have you come to destroy us before our time? They said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They know who the Son of God is. Now you may, be in, you may think you're indifferent. You may be so brainwashed in the, in, the, in, the, in the pop psychology of America. But when you walk into a church house sometime and all of a sudden your little world become, starts coming apart and you feel something spiritual moving inside you, it may be spirits that you've picked up and you didn't 
didn't even know it till you walked into the house of God and you were confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ. You may not know who he is, but the demons in you know who he is. Amen. Do they ever know who he is? You may be completely ignorant of the battle that rages in the spirit world. <laughs> you may not know a thing about what's going on in the real spiritual battle that goes on in this world. But the demons know, and they know who king, the king is. They know who the boss is. There was no equivocation here, no crawfishing, no him hawing around. That Bible says, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Hallelujah. You all know that? <laughs> Do you know the Lord Jesus is the Holy One of God? Amen. Amen. Yes, He is. Hallelujah. Notice the third thing that happens at the presence of Christ. Matthew chapter 8, verse 27. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Boy. So what does that mean? That means that the Lord Jesus Christ will create interest anywhere he shows up. Because you've never met anybody like him. And you'll never ever meet any more, anybody else like him. He's one of a kind. Oh, you may meet a lot of good Christian folk who love him and that's all good. And you can fellowship with them and that's all good. Thank God for God's people. I love to fellowship with the Lord's people. But they're not Christ. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. And when he shows up, dear friend, he will create interest. For they said, we know about Moses, we know about Jeremiah, we've read about Ezekiel, we know about Daniel, we know about all of them. But what manner of man is this that can speak to the wind and the sea and they obey him? What manner of man is he? He's the manner of man that can save your soul. What manner of man is he? He's the manner of man that can heal your body. There's a man sitting on the front row right here that had a leak in his spinal column. He came into this house a few weeks back. We anointed him with oil. He tells me this morning when he comes in, he said, Preacher, I'm healed. <laughs> Amen. Stand up, brother, and let him see you. I'm healed, he said. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm healed, he says. Oh, you say, preacher, you're a Baptist. You're not supposed to believe in healing. <laughs> Who told you that? Amen. I'm not one of them Baptists. <laughs> I'm a Baptist that believes in healing, folks. We anoint the sick and we, with oil and we pray over them. And we pray for God to do the healing. And then it's left up to him to do it. Amen. It's God's choice to make. So he creates interest. Everywhere he goes. Not only that, he reveals the secrets in the hearts of men. Yes, sir. The Bible says over here in the book of uh, John chapter number 8, And again he stooped down and rode on the ground. This is the second time. And the Bible said, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, <coughs> went out one by one, beginning at the eldest who had the most sins until the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Boy, that's another scene that you got to meditate on to take into your soul. Let's think about it a minute. They drag her up there before the Lord and the dust is flying all over the place. I'm sure they had that sanctimonious look on their face. We're going to see some blood and guts today. We're going to stone her to death. They drag her to the Lord Jesus Christ, taken in the act. I said, no question about her guilt. She was guilty. Everybody said, where's the man? Well, you know how that stuff works, don't you? She drug her. They drug her up before the Lord. And now let's see what he says. Moses and the law says. Oh, the law says. Well, you know who writes the laws, don't you? Rich men write the laws. Anybody ever tell you that? Yes, sir. You obey the law, but keep that in mind. A lot of laws are written to control you and give power and authority to a higher seat. This is why the apostles in the New Testament said we would obey God rather than men. Remember that one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not telling you to break the law, but I'm telling you something. There is one lawgiver that gives a perfect law, and the perfect law he gives is based on perfect righteousness. Amen. So they drug her before the Lord. They drug her before the Lord to stone her to death. Then he rolled in the ground and they left him. And there she stood with the master. And she wondered, now what's he going to do? And he said, daughter, go and sin no more. Has he did, did he do that for you? 
Did you ever meet him and he said to you, your sins are gone. I've forgiven you. Now go and sin no more. Have you ever been in your lifetime, God bless your soul, my dear friend, have you ever in your lifetime been just you and God? Amen. There's nothing like that. Just you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so she left. Then finally, when the Lord Jesus Christ's presence shows up, he will draw forth praise and adoration and joy. Look at this, Luke 7, 38. She stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Boy, man, I'd just kind of been elected. I'd like to have been sitting over in the corner somewhere just looking at a little bit of that to hear somebody that wept so much that she can take the tears, she can wash his feet. But notice what happens. There's always a progression with the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Everybody progresses in their relationship with him. There's a starting point, then there's a progression in that point. The Apostle Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The Apostle Paul understood that when God saved him, that that was the initial encounter he had with the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. But something deep down inside his soul said, Now, Paul, you just begun, son. There's more. And that's the point here. This is what's going on here. The Bible says this. It says that you shall know if you follow on to what? Know the Lord. There's more if you want more. When that one came back that had been healed, ten of them had been healed of leprosy, but only one returned. He said, where are the nine? This Samaritan, the Samaritan. It's in a good study. Do it sometime. That every time the word Samaritan shows up in the Bible or centurion shows up in the New Testament, read the context. You're amazed. It's amazing at the little messages that are in the context of centurions and Samaritans. Amen. Quite a thing. Amen. Quite a thing. Notice carefully what it says. In chapter number 7 of Luke in verse 38, she stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet. Now we jump forward, verse 48. And he said to her, Thy sins are forgiven. Verse 50. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. So what happened to her, preacher? I can't get into too much detail because the truth of the matter is some shade going on here. There's some gray area. But let me explain this to you because this is what's important. It really is. She followed the light she had and followed what she knew about Christ, and it took her to a much greater and deeper understanding of him. Here's some points that I want to give you before we close this morning. Simon, like a lot of people, needs to be awakened spiritually. Simon's sitting in there, and here's this woman that's weeping and washing his feet with tears, and he's oblivious to it. He didn't have a clue. He's sitting in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and doesn't have a clue who he is. He said, if this man were a prophet, so he doesn't know who he is. If this man were a prophet, he would know that this is a sinner. And he would not let her touch him. You see what I mean? She would defile him. You see, the righteousness of the Pharisee was carried on his sleeve and on his garments. He could be defiled. The high priest in the Old Testament... He could not touch a dead body, folks. If he touched that dead body, he would be defiled, right? Do you know why? Because his righteousness was his righteousness. He had to be so careful about where he went, who he touched, this and that and so forth. And so it is with this Pharisee. But if I'm correct in reading the Bible, it says to me that when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, that a woman was carrying her only son, and the beer, the coffin, he was in. The Bible says he walked up and he did what? When he, when he was touched by a leper, the leper normally would be a defilement. A priest could not be defiled by a leper. My goodness gracious. Horror. But a leper reached up and took hold and touched him. Did it defile him? No. Virtue 
went out from him. When he laid his hand on that casket, virtue, life-giving virtue, he raised the boy from the dead and gave him back to his mother. He said, what are you saying to us, preacher? I'm saying this. I'm saying if you're born again and you're washed in the blood of Christ and you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior, ain't nothing on the face of this earth can defile you. Your righteousness is not your righteousness. It is the righteousness of the Son of God. And that's what I'm trusting. You see, if everything pulls you down and defiles you, it's because you're living by you. If you're living by somebody else's righteousness, you can't be defiled. Amen. You follow me? Now, it can't be a joke. It can't be a put on. It can't be a fake. It can't be a facade. It has to be real. But if you are living by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, if that's your righteousness, not having my own righteousness, Paul said, but having the righteousness of the Son of God. Like Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, and she said it well. She said, every place I put my foot is holy ground. Amen. That's holy ground. Amen. That's holy ground. Amen. That's what she said. Is she right or wrong? What's your point, preacher? If it becomes holy when I put my foot down on it, then I'm not defiled by it. And I'm not corrupted by it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. You can walk in this sinful, cursed world. I'm not telling you to run out here and pull a, pull some dirty, stinking stunt and, and run with a devil and try all this. I'm telling you this. I'm telling you that when you belong to the Lord, you cannot be touched by Satan. He cannot defile you. Like I showed you a minute ago in the name of Jesus, he's got to leave you. Why, he can't defile me because he can't defile Christ. And my life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. Therefore, when I pray and I get on my knees and Satan says, now look, son, I've had some good conversation with the devil, some real good. I talked, had a good conversation with him this past week. You'd be amazed how smart the devil is. He can really, he can really talk to you about some stuff. And I get on my knees and Satan comes along and says, now who do you think you are? You think God's going to hear what you've got to say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at you. Here you are down here in this closet with the door shut. And you think you're going to pray to God? You're not perfect. Well, I know exactly why I've watched every step you took today. I know every place you've gone. I know all about you. And Satan will come and stand right over the top of your head and he'll begin to accuse you. He'll begin to blame you. He'll have you beaten to death. And you'll get up out of that closet and you'll say to yourself, well, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not. And I know I've done things today I shouldn't have done. And then God will say to you, that's what you're in this closet for, son. That's what you're in here for. That's why you're in here. You want the blood to cover that. And you want his righteousness to cover you. And you want the righteousness of Christ to give you strength. You want to learn where your sin's coming from. And you want to know what power you need to overcome that sin. You want to walk in fellowship with the Lord, don't you? Well, you can't walk in fellowship with the Lord by defeating sin on your part. You can't do it. But you can walk in fellowship with the Lord by receiving grace and strength from him to do it. And the only way you can receive grace and strength from God to walk in fellowship and power over sin is with a humble attitude saying, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Have mercy on me. I don't deserve it. But God help me. And he will cleanse your soul and give you peace in your heart. Now, I want to close with this one because I think it's quite remarkable. This is the part that I want you to understand. If you don't get anything else out of this message, I hope you get this part. A lot of folks come to church and they watch singing. They listen to the messages. They shake hands with each other. They walk out that back door and have no need for God whatsoever. No need. Oh, they're nice about it. They're sociable about it, you know. And uh, they don't cause a scene or anything like that. But when they walk out that back door, Christianity is nothing in their life. It means nothing to them. Let me tell you why. There's the first step in knowing God, and it is this simple step. It is what we call the awakening. It is that first moment in your life when you're not saying I'm a sinner. That's not saying anything. Everybody's a sinner. You talk to some old soul, and he says, I'm a sinner. That doesn't mean anything. He says, I'm a sinner. That doesn't mean a thing. 
It's when he's awakened to the condemnation that comes on his soul for sinning against God. He comes into the place of what we call conviction. He's awakened. All of a sudden, he's awake. All of a sudden, he or she, for the first time in their life, take an entirely different perspective on sin. That's the first step. Some of you haven't been there yet. Some of you have been there and you move past that point to conviction, then repentance and salvation. But some of you have, have yet to awaken. Simon was not awake. He was dead asleep. Here's Christ and a woman weeping and worshiping right in front of him, and he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue. And a lot of you come into the church house and you wonder, well, why, not, why is so and so so loud? Why are they jumping up and down? Why is this crowd over here shouting? What's going on here? Ain't no ball game in here today. I mean, what's, what's, all, this, what's all this emotionalism about? I mean, good, can't we be a little, a little more refined? And, 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 on, and on and on and on it goes. You know, here's the thing. You take a soul that's been brought up out of hell, that's been lifted up out of the pit, and I mean, some of them, I mean, tell you, some of them, they know where they came from and they know what they used to be. You take a soul like that that comes into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and their Savior and their Master, they're going to shout, they're going to cry, they're going to jump up and down, they're going to do whatever they do. Everybody doesn't do the same thing. You don't need to follow anybody's lead. You do what you do. But when you come into the house, you've got freedom because you want to worship him and the tears flow and the joy flows and you say hallelujah to God. That's what I used to be, but I'm not anymore. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, she said, but now I see. That's the awakening. I pray for that because God awakened me in 1973. He hit me out of the clear blue. It wasn't a gradual thing. Some folks, it's gradual. One size doesn't fit all. Some folks, it's gradual. Over a period of time, they begin to really feel like there's something going on here. They're trying to find the answer, and they run here, run there, try this religion, try that religion, try this, try that. They don't know what's wrong. There's something wrong. But there's a hunger in here for something. That's a gradual awakening. With me, it was boom. I got up one morning, and I was going to hell. I went to bed one night just to reprobate and got up the next morning and all of a sudden I'm going to the pit. And I mean, it just hit me out of the clear blue. And I couldn't live with it. And I was under conviction like you would not believe. And buddy, I had no peace until I bowed my head and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart as my soul and save me. And when I raised my head back up, I was a new person in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And I've never been the same since then. Praise God. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, you take this little old message this morning, parts of it, all of it, however you want to use it for somebody somewhere, and use it, Father, for the glory of God. May they forget who I am. I'm nothing. I don't count. Put me in the, side, in the back somewhere and think about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. There's none like him. There is none like him. In his holy, righteous, blessed name I pray. In the name of Jesus, for his sake, amen. Let's stand up this morning.